We'll be doing the getting started with breadboarding. So it'll be a really basic overview. And afterwards, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Or if you have some projects you are already thinking about, uh, go ahead and talk about those as well. Maybe uh, some good formats for prototyping and how to get those on a circuit board. So let's roll into it. Um, I've been working at Make for the past four years. I started in the Make Labs, where we would test the projects for the magazine. And then we document them and figure out if there's any bugs. So that involves programming, circuits. Um, and to be honest, four years ago, I had no idea how to do any of that. Uh, I had no idea what Arduino was. I slowly learned how to do C++ and programming. And uh, finally, uh, got into electronics, because uh, I had to. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. And so the way that I go about circuits is sort of how to interface sensors with motors and basic electronics to basically get things to move and have motion. So one example I love is my CNC machine, which I built um, using some hardware components that you basically assemble onto a small mill. And then you add the motors and the motor drivers and use some programming. And eventually, it machines parts on its own. So. Some common questions that I get asked about breadboarding sort of is like, what's the point? Why would you even want to bother with that? Um, basically, once people learn how to solder, all you want to do is just get your circuit. You see it online. You want to build it. You get your components and just start soldering. And what happens, for me at least, is I always botch it up. So um, for me, breadboarding is essential. Um, Additionally, how does it work? What is the breadboard? Uh, what is behind the plastic facade? Uh, how do you wire it up? What are the nuances of it? We'll kind of go into that. Um, additionally, what types of breadboards should I use? What's the difference between the sizes, the colors, the configurations? And then you know, the best question of all is, is the hardest to answer is, why won't my circuit work? Um, that's a little tricky to answer, usually a case-by-case -case basis, but there's a couple things we can do. So um, and finally, you know, once you have something on this breadboard, what do you do with it? Do you keep it on the breadboard? Do you transfer it somehow? Um, and what are your options for that? So uh, this is sort of the workflow in my mind, at least. I'll start with a tangle of wires. Uh, no, this is not my projects normally. Uh, this is I found on Wikipedia, but you know, you have a mess of wires, uh, and usually, hopefully, at the end, it works. But then you need to somehow translate it to a final product, if that's what you're trying to do. Usually it's a circuit board, or it's a, maybe it's a schematic, or you just want to make sure that the prototype works. So the workflow is take this mess of wires, figure out if the circuit actually works how you think it should work, and then get it to be the final product. So um, these are actually the driver boards in the CNC machine that I'm using. So that's a, a great example of how you know, the end result from the circuits is something you use uh, every day. The second option, or the second reason, uh, rather, to breadboard is you don't want to end up like this at the end of the day, kind of wondering what does the red wire connect to, or how do I get the power turned on? Um, again, I'm here at the workbench, and I'm ready to solder something together, but I can't remember how the circuit went together or you know, what the order was. So breadboarding really helps in that prototyping stage to kind of figure it out. Um, my mindset, at least, is that breadboarding is a skill. It's something that you're going to develop. Uh, I still make silly mistakes all the time, but over, over time and over practice, you, know, you get more comfortable with it. You understand how the breadboard works, uh, little tips and tricks, or maybe shortcuts you can do to make it so that the circuit looks more organized, so that when there is a problem, you can work backwards to figure out where the errors are. And simple things like making sure you have color codes for your wires, or make sure that you route the wires in a logical fashion that makes sense to you. Um, it'll be different for each of your experiences. But in the end, the idea is to, to build something, to make sure it works. Um, and the best part about breadboarding, at least, is you can always reuse your components when you're done. Uh, you just pluck them off the board, put them back in your work tray, and you're ready to go. So let's kind of roll into the the details of the breadboard itself. Um, here's a great illustration that one of our uh, illustrators did, uh, Jody. And so a lot of breadboards are rectangular or square in shape. They vary in size. Here's one of the larger uh, breadboards that I've found. Uh, I love having the extra space. Even though it's a simple, small circuit sometimes, just having the extra space around is just uh, really comfortable for me to work with. So as you can see in the illustration, um, there's a couple rows and a bunch of dots on the breadboard. And usually, these lines on the sides are for your power rails. And that's where you're going to either input your battery power, or maybe it's from a power supply. And there's, there's no hard, fast rule. There's just conventions. You know? You'll see a positive and a minus terminal. It's ideal that you would use the positive terminal from your battery to go into that positive line. And then all of the uh, terminals in that 
horizontal row, or vertical row, excuse me, will become um, gener uh, with electricity. Likewise, if you ground this long negative terminal, all of the row, or all of the uh, spots in this row, they're all connected. When you go into the actual board itself, where there are sort of the, what we're calling the um, tie points, the tie points actually go in the horizontal direction. So if you put a component as shown um, in the left right hand illustration, there is an LED and a resistor. Um, the bottom leg of the LED and the resistor are actually on the same electrical node. So they have the same voltage potential. Um, it's, it's opposite of the power terminals, but um, once you get past that convention, you're usually pretty good to go. Uh, another great way to check that is, of course, if you have a multimeter and you have a continuity uh, tester, just put two wires in there, and you pretty quickly figure out, OK, you know, these nodes connect horizontal, and the uh, power terminals go up and down. So once we kind of get that taken care of, uh, you can start to do some things with uh, integrated circuits, microchips, and whatnot. And you'll see, if you look in illustration or on the boards, there's these deep ridges, these trenches. And those are physical separations. So you know, this left-hand side of the board and the right-hand side of the board, they're physically separated by that trench. So there's no connections. Um, there's no contacts. And what that allows you to do is you can put a chip, kind of like in the bottom uh, left-hand corner. And that straddles that, that trench. So all of those pins are on their own separate nodes. Um, and there's no electrical connection between them. We'll kind of go on to, again, there's the grounding bus and the tie points, um, better illustration, um, and then the power bus. And then, again, top right-hand corner, the, in the grayed-out area, those are all connected together. Um, one way that you connect components with your breadboard is either with uh, other components, like resistors, capacitors, or um, jumper wires. So jumper wires can be made of a flexible wire, um, or a solid core wire. And that'll depend more on your preference. I found that the solid core wire is great because you can bend it and you can really sort of make these road paths with it, almost like, um, like little roadways. And you can actually visually see each connection really nicely. Um, if you remember the beginning slide, there were all of those really just loose wires kind of scattered about. It's really hard to visually see what's going on. You have to kind of trust that you did it properly. Um, and it makes debugging a really kind of headache. Um, Different types of breadboards, they come, again, in different sizes, different arrays. There's these large ones, again, um, and I love using the larger ones for space. But they're as small as in the top left-hand corner. They fit on top of an Arduino if you wanted to. Um, and then in the bottom left-hand corner are some examples of how you can have your microcontrollers hooked up next to a breadboard for easy prototyping. Um, maybe you don't want to permanently connect your components onto the microcontroller itself. So having this platform is a great way to sort of experiment. And then again, the larger ones. Um, in this picture, we didn't have these because of, of traveling reasons. But on the left-hand corner, there's the black, yellow, red, and green terminals. And those are great if you have uh, large external power supplies. They're actually screw terminals. So you take some wire strippers, cut off some of the wire from the power supply. You thread them into those connections. And then you can actually jump wires from those connections onto your breadboard. And it's a really nice way to kind of spread or dissipate the power. So if you want you know, one side of the board to have uh, 15 volts and the other side to have 5 volts, uh, you can do that using different colors, your different sequences, and so on. Um, also in this example, on the left-hand side, um, going vertical, uh, you can see another, basically, a, a power bus. And so it works the same way as the uh, power strips on the upper side of the board. Um, just more flexibility for how you want to wire things up. As I mentioned, the jumper wires, um, I honestly prefer the stranded because they're easier to work with, but they do make a bigger mess. Um, and then a great thing to know is that the, the solid core is usually 22 gauge. That's a really easy uh, gauge to use. You can make your own jumper wires, or you can buy them in packs like this. Um, in the maker shed or you know whatnot for probably like around ten dollars. They come color coded. They're cut to certain lengths, so they're really easy just to kind of fit in between the components. Um, but again, you could grab your your own color of solid core wire and uh, just pick off maybe a quarter inch of the wire so that the bare metal is exposed and just bend them at a ninety degree angle with some needle nose pliers, and you have your own jumper wires. It's uh, pretty easy to do that. What else? So a little bit of problem solving. Again, can't go over all of the problems you have, but I would highly recommend if you're prototyping, go ahead and have a multimeter 
Uh, you'll be able to test with the multimeter your voltages, make sure you have power to the power rails, make sure you have proper grounding. You'll also be able to check and make sure you have continuity between the components you think are connected. A uh, really common mistake is that when you're looking at all these little dots on the board, you know, you think you're in row 20 and really you're in row 21 and for some reason your circuit won't turn on and after hours and hours of pulling your hair out, you realize, oh, it's one simple connection. The whole circuit was actually correct. It was just off by one little spacing. So um, a continuity tester is, is a great tool to have uh, if you have some issues. Um, with the, the stranded wires, um, sort of going back to way back in the beginning, this picture on top, if for some reason that circuit wasn't working, but you thought, you know, I think this is wired up the way it should be, it's, it electronically should be sound, go ahead, put your hand on top of those wires and kind of squish it down, it'll kind of give. If you see that all of a sudden electronics flicker on, flicker off, you know that it's either a wire or a connection in your actual breadboard. And so over time, the metal contacts inside the breadboard, um, they'll just wear out from having components be shoved in them. Sometimes, you know, diodes especially, the, uh, the wires that connect the diodes to the silicon, they're pretty thick compared to a resistor. And so over time, if you shove a diode into the little socket, um, it's going to spread those little uh, metallic forks out. And so after a while, you, you, know, you go to use your breadboard one day, you put in some stranded wire, everything looks good, and the circuit won't turn on. And it's because you know, your breadboard's getting worn out. Not a big deal if you have your continuity tester, right? You can fix that pretty quick. So jump ahead again. So if you've successfully built something, um, it can come in a many forms. This is from a camper um, from Maker Camps 2012. It was Timothy, and he showed me one of his projects. He built an arcade system using a laptop. And for the most part, it's just a computer uh, that he disassembled and put into a really cool acrylic uh, enclosure. But then he also added an Arduino, a breadboard, and some push buttons for an interface. Um, did some programming with that. But you can see here, this is a perfect example. You can actually use your breadboard as the final result. If, if it's working and you like it, great. Go ahead, put it in an enclosure, do what you're going to do, and go about your business. Um, if he was going to bring this to maybe Maker Faire, I might suggest he put this onto a perf board and maybe bust out the soldering iron, just because during travel, those wires will get disconnected really easily, especially for the stranded wires, how they're kind of loose and flailing. Um, you don't want to travel somewhere, you're going to show off your project, and all of a sudden you can't remember which, which little terminal am I supposed to put this yellow wire. Um, that's a horrible feeling. Uh, so anyways, if you don't want to keep the breadboard as part of your final circuit, there's a couple options for you. Once you actually have the breadboard the looking the way you want to, um, I really enjoy using an open source software called Fritzing. And Fritzing is um, like, sort of like an electronic workbench, if you will. You can actually physically see all your connections on a digital breadboard. You can do big breadboards, small breadboards. It's all in the software package. It's all free, open source. And you can put your components in place. Uh, you can also use this before you start to actually start the prototyping process. Uh, I found this really helpful for color coding, um, picking out where the LEDs are going to go, making sure that I have enough space on my board to fit all the components I'm going to need. And then you know, once you get the picture on the screen looking like the breadboard you have in physical space, you can go to the next step if you want. And you can actually go from a schematic all the way down to a PCB layout. And maybe that's something you want to eventually look into is how to etch your own PC boards, or maybe how to machine your own PC boards using a CNC machine or a fabrication lab. And so this software is great for all of these things and just simply seeing, you know, do I have enough space on the breadboard to fit you know, all my ICs, my resistors, my LEDs, and the wires? Um, so that sort of sums up my presentation. Um, again, I'll be over in the back, if you haven't seen it, at the Make HQ tent, uh, talking about microcontrollers, and um, would love to talk more about breadboarding if you have any questions. Or if you want to open the floor up, we could talk about if you guys have specific questions about projects you're working on, you know, how are you going to mount them, and how are you going to work on them. So um, either way, I'm open to questions. Sure. Yeah, so the question is, when you have fritzing, how do you get to the final PCB layout? And so what happens is 
you go to the breadboard and you know when you start you just put on wires and you have to actually click and drag to make it really nice and so they're all geometric and square and so that's a little tedious but if you're a little OCD like I am um, it's really worth it. Um, once you have this you then go over to a second tab and the tab actually just sort of plops everything in the middle and it's really tricky at first because it's all overlapping you can't see the wires aren't color coded anymore it's more like a textbook schematic but what you do is you click and drag just like the same way you make everything kind of pretty and how you visually would expect it on a schematic or whatever works for you and then again from the PCB layout you open the new tab it's all in the center it's all mishmash and you got to click and drag and that's actually one of the cool parts I find is how to design the circuit um, and you could spend hours making a pretty circuit, making a well-designed circuit. That's a whole other topic, but yeah. And it's a Mac and um, Windows-based. I don't know about Linux, but um, yeah, I would highly recommend it. Just check it out. Anything else? Cool. All right, I'll be at the Make Tent. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>